Yes, good morning, Thomas Schmidt. Thank you for joining me for our conversation. It's a pleasure to talk to you about ethical theories. And I'd like to get started with a very simple question. Um, what is an ethical theory? Thanks for having me uh, to begin with. Uh, as I'm sure you are aware of, it's not a simple question at all. But in one first shot would be ethical theories are attempts to say something informative and true about ethical questions, of which there are, of course, heaps of different ones. The most important ethical question, as far as I'm concerned, is which actions are right and which are wrong, and in virtue of what, because of what, are right actions right and wrong actions wrong. Now, one of the most important issues when it comes to formulating ethical theory is to make sure that the two things which I've said, it has to be true or defensible and informative, might conflict. Consider, for instance, somebody saying, well, an action is right if and only if it is not wrong. That's true, but it's not informative. If somebody says an action is right if it's done on Mondays and is wrong otherwise, that's informative, but false. So the, there is this standard conflict which is everywhere in theorizing, but in moral theorizing maybe even more so between saying something true and something informative. And that's, I think, the main obstacle one needs to overcome when it comes to formulating something which deserves to be called an ethical theory. So if the main project uh, you find interesting in ethical theories is to judge whether an action is right or wrong, uh, we see that there are a lot of ethical theories and uh, philosophy students learn in the first uh, terms that there are so many theories. Some of uh, the moral philosophers are Kantians, others are utilitarians, and others are virtue ethicists. So I know that you work amongst other topics on ethical pluralism. Why are you interested in this, in this topic? Now, Kantians and utilitarians to take maybe the most important theories in the arena of those theories which aim to say something about which actions are right or wrong, agree in one basic respect. Civilians? Both Kantians, or Kant himself indeed, and utilitarians say, when an action is right, this is in virtue of the very same fact, whatever the action is. Kant holds roughly that whether or not an action is right depends on the maxim of that action. If the maxim has a certain property, then the action is right because of that, roughly speaking. And this is true for all right actions. All right actions are made right, if you want to talk in that way, by the very same type of fact. The same goes for utilitarians. They say an action is right if and only if it maximizes overall utility in whatever precise sense. But again, by the lights of utilitarianism, all right acts are made right by the very same, by the very same uh, fact or property. Now, to that extent, both these views are monist, as this is sometimes called. There is just one property which makes right acts right and wrong acts wrong. Pluralists think that this is false. It's just not the case, by the lights of pluralists, that there is one and only one property which makes right acts right. Uh, and one and only one property which makes wrong acts wrong. But there is indeed a plurality of morally relevant factors which, depending on the context, are the ones uh, which are, as it were, responsible for right acts being right. For instance, if you've promised to do something and there is nothing morally more important to do, then you ought to keep your promise. Keeping your promise is right, and indeed not only right, uh, but every alternative given the situation is, as I've been sketching it, wrong. And the fact that you've promised to do whatever you've promised to do, plus the fact there is nothing morally important to do, makes, intuitively speaking, the act right. Pluralists say, well, this is not only intuitively speaking so, but this is so in fact. In this case, the fact that you promised to do that is the right-making factor. In other cases, the fact that you might benefit somebody else in a case in which there is nothing morally more important to do might be the factor which makes the act of benefiting the other person right, etc. So there's a plurality of different factors. So you seem to be 
very, very favorable uh, with regard to pluralism. Why is pluralism so attractive? As I've been trying to indicate, pluralism is relatively close, closer, it seems to me and to others, as than Kantianism and Utilitarianism to the way we deliberate in everyday moral contexts. In, in particular in situations in which we're not sure what to do, what we do is we take our yellow pad, draw a line, say those are the moral pros, those are moral cons, and we, you know, itemize, well, or tend to itemize mentally, or not on our sheets of paper, the morally relevant factors which seem to bear on the, on the situation at hand. What are the moral pros, what are the moral cons, and how do they, how is their normative weight when, in, in that context when compared to each other? And that's precisely the deliberation which is described as how we ought to deliberate by the lights of pluralists, because there, are, there is at least a potential plurality of morally relevant factors out of which we need to figure out which are the ones which are pertinent to the case at hand. And then, after having done that, we are supposed to figure out which are, which are the ones which are more important. So, proximity to common sense in that respect. Second feature, proximity to common sense in another respect. We often experience, I think, uh, moral situations as being situations of conflict. Not of conflict between, let's say, my views and your views, but conflicts between moral factors which point in different directions. On the one hand side, I've promised to say her whether or not she got the position as soon as I know. On the other hand side, I know now, i.e. keeping my promise would require me to say, to tell her now that she didn't get the job. On the other hand, it's her birthday and she's in the middle of the party, etc., etc. So there is a conflict of different morally relevant factors. Um, in order for that to be not only superficially, but as it were, as a matter of normative fact, indeed so, it has to be the case that there are different morally fa relevant factors which can, as it were, point in different directions. This is precisely what pluralism says, right? There's, you know, there is just the very plurality which makes it possible for there to be more conflict of the sort we tend to experience in the first place. So let us turn to, to more general question, uh, what can we expect and what can we maybe not expect from an ethical theory? Uh, and to what extent can we expect an ethical theory to provide us with ethical principles? Now, the very idea of a theory, wherever it is, does in, seem to involve the idea of being given something general over and above just you know, a lump collection of individual answers to individual questions. And to that extent, it's natural uh, and also theoretically desirable to be provided with some sort of moral principles by an ethical theory. Having said this, uh, I'm unhappy about the way in which people talk about principles, or many people talk about principles in ethics. Um, because by my lights, a principle has to satisfy certain, meet certain standards with regard to being informative in order to deserve the name principle in the first place. For instance, actually yesterday I met a colleague of mine and told him that I'm, as I'll be explaining in a minute, a bit skeptical with regard to the extent to which there are indeed defensible and sufficiently substantial moral principles. Um, and whatever the details of the that conversation were, he said basically, well, I believe in those principles. And then I said, look, uh, you know, give me just one example. Um, and then he said, well, if you've promised to do something, then uh, it might be uh, right to perform the promised act or something along those lines. This, by my light, doesn't qualify as a principle. Because if you've promised to do something, then I think, I don't know anybody who would disagree that then the action of keeping the promise might be right. That's not something which we need an ethical theory to tell us, to put it bluntly, right? Similarly, if somebody comes along and says, well, if an action is a lie, then it's morally wrong. I take that to be false, because there are cases in which sadly, or maybe not even sadly, uh, it's morally permissible or indeed obligatory to lie. Sometimes it's even completely unproblematic. There are games which require you to lie, otherwise the game is no fun at all. I know everybody knows this, but this doesn't disqualify those things which are doing the game as lies. 
But it would be very odd to say, well, you know, the game is morally suboptimal because it involves lying. But, you know, the fun of it compensates for that. It would, that's ridiculous. Of course, the game is not problematic at all, even though there are lies. So the, the, the claim that if you lie, then this is, false, this is morally wrong, is just false. Then the people having said, well, lying is wrong, say, well, no, this, this wasn't meant like that. I mean, lying is wrong unless, well, in general, it's wrong. Celebris paribus, it's wrong. Prima facie, it's wrong. Prima vista, it's wrong. Pro tanto, it's wrong. And they keep, keep talking Latin and other sorts of things. And by my lights, this doesn't increase the degree to which this is informative at all. So what one wants is something sufficiently substantive over and above, well, in general, lying is wrong, for instance, or uh, lying is wrong unless uh, there is an exception. All of that might be so, but uh, I find that on the edge of being ridiculously vacuous, i.e. in order for there uh, to be something which deserves to be called a principle, it has to be sufficiently substantive. And I think the, the punchline here is uh, one should really take the challenge of formulating sufficiently substantive uh, and sufficiently defensible and plausible ethical principles serious and let it lead one where the moral facts lead one, to put it somewhat grandiosely. And the sad or maybe not so sad truth might be that the degree to which we actually arrive at sufficiently substantive principles which are defensible might be limited. For instance, David Ross, who's the most important ethical pluralist, says what we've got are certain principles stating roughly, he didn't put it precisely in those terms, but that's the way to understand him, I think. If an action is an act of promise keeping, then there is a moral reason to do it. If an act is an act of harming, then there's a moral reason against doing it. If an act is an act of benefiting others, there's a moral reason to do it, etc., etc. You have roughly five to seven, depending on the pages where you look, principles of roughly that sort. And those moral reasons can conflict, which they do, and we should, as I've been saying, understand morality anyway, as often involving these sorts of conflicts. But of course, then the question becomes what to do in case of those conflicts. And Ross said, look, judgment needs to kick in here because there are no principles. And very many people are unhappy about Ross. Uh, on this front and say, well, you know, look, he hasn't even done his homework when it comes to coming up with a sufficiently complete ethical theory in the first place. But I take it the truth here is if somebody believes that uh, those principles about lying, about promise keeping, not harming others, etc., on the right track, and it's unhappy about Ross not having provided principles of weighing, telling us what to do in case of conflict, then they should say which principles of weighing they find appropriate. Just, Ross just has said, look, I haven't found any. And uh, it's better to say the truth, which might be, it just depends. <laughs> and there is no principle sufficiently informatively specifying in what way it depends on the context. Better saying that than coming up with a false principle which leads, misleads you in a matter of importance in the first place. So better no principle at all than False ones. That's the deal. T take the case of, of humor, right? By my lights, there are objectively funny jokes. Or at least jokes which are such that everybody with a decent sense of humor ought to laugh about them. And if she doesn't, then it's not a problem of the joke, but of the person. Now, uh, are there any principles of humor? You know, a joke is funny if and only if, blah, blah, blah. I, actually, I, I tried the game of coming up with those, <laughs> you know, cooking up jokes from principles. That's, of course, a ridiculous enterprise. I'm not saying that morality is like humor in that respect, but it might be closer to humor in that respect than many people think. It just might be so complex. Uh, or looking at those fantastic pictures around us, you know, aesthetics, works of art, might have objective evaluative qualities, even though there is no way of uh, codifying those in terms of principles, which sufficiently informatively state what it is that makes a great work of art a great work of art. It might be similar, at least to an extent, 
or at least to a greater extent that one would, hide, would hope in the case of, uh, of morality. So our everyday experiences uh, teaches us that we, um, we really like ethical principles in our everyday practices. For example, we teach our children uh, principles as you should not lie. Um, how, would you, how would you answer to, to this aspect? Actually, I've, I've, my son is now 12. And quite early on, I, I presume as every parent did with their kids, taught him, look, you should never ever break your promise. Right. Also, you should never ever, indeed that very case, lie. And um, I can't recall precisely when it was, but maybe three or four years ago, so when he was eight or nine, I said, look, uh, you know that that's not true, right? And he said, yes, of course. Uh, and I said, look, basically, I didn't mean, I didn't put it in those terms to him. But the truth is that I didn't mean those assertions, you should never lie. You should always keep your promises as being assertions of something purportedly true. But I took those to be, as it were, speech acts, the point of which was to get him to become a morally decent person. But uh, to use Wittgenstein's metaphor, after he's been climbing up the ladder, at least as far as promises are concerned, or lying, the ladder could be thrown away. Uh, and he came to realize by himself, I didn't even have to tell him, that of course uh, there are promises which one may or indeed ought to break in order to do something morally important which happened as it were along the way. Or that of course there are lies which are morally at least permissible, if not, um, if not entirely unproblematic, as the ones I've been referring to before. So those principles we use, for instance, in education, are not principles properly so called, but have a different function from the one of making true claims. When it comes to the question of assessing an ethical theory, to what extent should we uh, make structural considerations and to what extent do they play a role in how to assess the quality of an ethical theory, such as uh, simplicity, for example? Ross had this famous passage, which I can't resist quoting, against utilitarianism and consequentialism by saying, well, quote, it's more important to fit the facts than for a theory to fit the facts than for it to be simple, end of quote. That's precisely what he objected to consequentialism. I think he was right. It's at least odd, if not false, what many people believe to be the two, two, two important desiderata an ethical theory needs to satisfy. Namely, first, to say something you know, justifiable or something true about how, how you know, what, what makes right actions right, etc., etc. And secondly, to be action guiding and to be informative when it comes to making moral choice. It just might be that there is a conflict between those two, two goals. Since the truth is quite complicated, it might be that the true moral principles are so complicated uh, that they are in no serious sense action guiding at all. When it comes to saying something important and true about ethical theory, one of the most important, as it were, meta-truths we should, as ethicists, tell people is that in morality, as well as elsewhere, the truth just might be and indeed should be expected to be very, very complicated. Um, and one shouldn't be ready too quickly to accept simple answers. And I take that to be a message which has an important point uh, not only, but maybe specifically in times in which populism is more strong than it had been for quite a while. I mean, one of the most important factors explaining the rise of populism is that people are so, uh, um, so much prone to believe simpler than more complex answers to questions uh, which are of major concern to them and politically important, and not the least because of that, it's so important to keep repeating on the general level and also 
when it comes to the details of specific cases, um, that even though politics requires a certain pragmatic view with regard to declaring deliberations to an end in order to make choices and set you know, policy, policies into practice, nevertheless, uh, that matters typically are very complicated, difficult, and that there is lots of uncertainty with regard to figuring out potential consequences of political policies, and which is why the deliberative attitude with regard to constantly being open uh, to the option of things being different than one had thought, or at least more complicated than one had thought, uh, is not only important in moral theorizing, uh, but in politics and elsewhere across the board. Thank you, Thomas Schmidt, for sitting down with me and having with me this conversation on ethical theory. It was a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you very much. And thank you for that. I really enjoyed that. It was a great pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.